Hey everyone, welcome back to the Pelvic Pulse podcast. I'm really, really excited for this intersectional. It feels intersectional because of the birth story that birth stories, I should say, that our guest Samantha is going to share with us. Um, but it feels intersectional because you are also someone who works in the healthcare system and in that world, just as I do. Um, so I'll just share a little bit first, maybe about how we interacted, but it was so cool because I had been a little more open on social media than I had been in expressing my desire and my curiosity around free birth. And I've only ever heard from one client who has actually done that. And it was a beautiful experience from what I had listened to and um, witnessed for her and just in her postpartum. And you reached out to me, Samantha, uh, in the DMs and you're like, if I could do it, you could do it. And then I just, I loved that energy that you had around it. So I'm so grateful that you um, shared that with me. And I'm so, so grateful that you're willing to come on and talk about your experiences. I didn't realize that you had two babies, <laughs> but we started talking and um, you were sharing about the move that you just had and how you actually have a toddler and a newborn. So I'm excited to hear two stories in, in one episode. So welcome. And yeah, so happy to have you here. So happy to be here. Yeah, I'm glad anytime anyone's like free birth, I'm like, yes, you can totally do it. <laughs> and I know it's probably you have like a big following. So for you to come out and say like what you've been thinking and wanting to do. And um, I think it's really brave for you to say that because you don't know the backlash that you can get coming from like a medical background, right? Um, yeah. Um, so I thought it was really brave for you to share. And I just wanted to kind of share, lead you on and say, yeah, you can totally do it. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate that so much. How, how did you come to that decision? And like, where were you at in your, maybe even in your work life and your process? And yeah, yeah. I'll go, I guess I'll just start um, like from the beginning and then kind of ease into my first birth story too. So um, I got pregnant 2021. Um, loved the idea of like a home birth. Um, but my husband was kind of like, oh, like unwary of it. Um, so we kind of met in the middle. I don't even know if it's in the middle, but um, hospital birth, but with the doula. So we had the doula. Um, knew nothing about free birth at all until like later, later, later. So I'll just kind of tell my first birth first. So my first birth was, you know, typical medicalized scans. Um appointments twice a month or every other week. I don't know. I don't remember that. Um, ultrasounds, the whole GP testing, everything. Um, pregnancy was fine, but a lot of like normal anxiety as a first time mom, um, actually, especially cause going into the doctors, um, the appointments were so short. I'll get a call the next thing saying I have to get tested for so-and-so. And I was like, the doctor never even told me any of this, like what's going on. Why do I have an appointment with this doctor next. And there was like no communication. And I felt very like blindsided by that or kind of like what, like, I felt like they should explain it to me. And even when I, and as a first time mom, you kind of don't know these things because no one tells you and you're just kind of like following the rules. Um, but coming from like a medical background, I felt like I could advocate for myself. And as OTs, we always advocate for our patients too. So I thought I'm like, I still am advocating for myself, trying to speak up for myself, but there weren't really clear answers. It's just like, go to this test, get this ultrasound done, do X, Y, Z. And you don't want to not listen to them because you're carrying like a baby and you want to make sure your baby's safe too. Um, now looking back on it, it's like, I would never have done that, which, um, <laughs> So anyways, fast forward, I had my birth um, in the hospital. He was 37 weeks, so he was quite early. So I had no, I had one more appointment with my doula to kind of hear about how like labor and all that stuff kicks in and even with my OB. So I had no idea that like, you know, I had no idea about milk coming in. I just had no idea because I thought I had three more weeks to learn all this. So when he came super early, um, 
super uh, long labor, like 14 hours. Um, no idea. Like my water didn't break bloody show. I didn't know what that was either. They brought me to the hospital. I was already five centimeters dilated. Um, which is like, yay, cool. Right. Like I'm like, cool. I'm like halfway there, but mm -hmm. I end up laboring for like a whole 14 hours because nurses came in. Now that I process my birth, I can like talk about it. Like this nurses came in touching me while I was in the middle of a contraction asking to be checked. Um, like another male doctor came in. I'm like, I never even seen you. Like, I don't want you to check me. It was like all these things that were like sticking oh. by me and me just so medicalized and, mm -hmm did not enjoy laboring at all at the hospital. Um, I end up um, pushing him out in six minutes when it was actually time to push, which is like so cool, right? Wow. <laughs> um, but that birth, I don't want to scare anyone, but I literally felt like I was going to die. <laughs> like I was opening up, but it was unmedicated. So at the end of the birth, I'm like, that was such a beautiful birth. It was every birth that I wanted, unmedicated, quick pushing, um, great. Right. Like I had a healthy baby. It was fine. Um, then I get pregnant again, fast forward to get pregnant again, two years later. And I was, um, I think this was the time when I got pregnant. And then I was like, I've found a podcast about like, it was free birth society pretty much. And I'm sure we all know that. And I was like, this is crazy. Like women give birth on their own like that's just wild like that's so crazy but the more I started researching about it and re and hearing stories from other women doing it I'm like this makes so much sense like everything just like clicked and I was like this is what I want to do and as I process my first birth I'm like wait a second like so many things were like sabotage from that first birth like I felt like my labor could have been so much more faster or I would have felt much more comfortable um, everyone was telling me what to do in that first birth. Um, so this time I told my husband, I'm like, hey, can we do a home birth? And he was like, yeah, I mean, you rock that first birth. I'll do whatever you want to do. Like, I trust you. You make, you know, like I trust you. That in itself, it's so nice to have a partner that really supports your decision. Um, but I don't think he knew I was looking into like free birth. <laughs> Um, so we did, we got a midwife for the home birth, um, but I delayed it all the way until like 23 weeks. So I didn't actually find mm -hmm. anyone until, cause I wanted to kind of really figure out what I wanted to do. So again, like this time around, no test, um, no ultrasounds. Um, and it was so nice. Like the first 20 weeks of being pregnant and everyone was asking me like all these questions and we're kind of just like brushed it away. And Amanda was like, she hasn't even seen a doctor. I don't know what she's doing, but I trust her. Amanda was my partner. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was just so great. Like, I think every doctor's appointment that I went to with my first birth, it was so like fear inducing, like, you know, 20, you know, like your baby's not growing fast enough. Um, you need to eat this, you need to, and like taking your weight and your blood pressure, but I didn't have to do any of that as long as I felt good. Um, and I did feel good. Like I physically, I walked every day, I hiked every day, swam, I did yoga, Pilates. Um, I felt like I wanted to do this work on my own where I felt where I can trust my body. And then I felt like after giving birth the first time, not only, I felt like it was more of a mental um, thing than it was like a physical thing. Like, yeah, you can be healthy, but at the same, I mean, yeah, you should be healthy, but at the same time, like, it's all like how you view the birth and how you kind of set your mind up to what you want to do. And so this time I'm like, I want to do this by myself. Like how cool it is that women do that. And I feel like it's the most embodied like thing to achieve, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't do a scan until like 23 weeks because my husband wanted to know the gender of the baby, which I didn't mm -hmm. want to. Um, so did he tell you or did he, he find out? So we did this, we did one scan to do the gender and then we did like a cake reveal. <laughs> like we the did it. Yeah. I um, was super cute. My, my son was one and a half. So we gave him the cupcake and we were like, okay, what color is it? And we were like rehearsed colors. And he was like, he said the opposite color, what it was. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was like, so excited. <laughs> and then it was like, 
the opposite. So it's just really cute though. Um, so we got one scan and then um, we stuck with the midwife, even though I didn't really want to, but you already pay like a fat chunk of money. <laughs> but I told her that I just didn't want to do any visits until like it was necessary. So like no test I want to do. I don't want to do any ultrasounds. I don't want to do any of the GB testing. Um, and for her to come just instead of twice a month, maybe like once a month. So I only saw her by the time, like a handful, like five times before my birth, even probably even less. Um, and I thought it was just so cool because she was really respectful of my decisions and I was talking to my husband. I'm like, I don't understand how come in the medical system, there's, they're very like, no, you need to take the scan or you need to do this, um, sugar drink. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and then my midwife was like, okay, I trust you. You're healthy. You feel good. You don't have to do any of those tests. Like, and she just like, kind of like respected my decision. And that was such a breath of fresh air. Um, because no one is making you feel anxious or pressured to do any of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's so all about the money. It's insane. I can't even. I've been, yeah, I've been talking to friends about like specifically that, um, just the testing and even how, I mean, there's just one particular story that I'm like thinking about right now where she was explaining to me that at some hospitals, they will literally make you wait while you're quote unquote pushing um, or like laboring. They'll make you wait until the OB or the midwife can come into the room so that they can catch the baby. Because if they don't catch the baby, then they can't charge you for that at the hospital. And I'm just like, so speaking of like, that's, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, I was just thinking like, that is wild. That's insane. If they, literally like made you pause and wait because they want to be able to do that like I'm not sure if that's that's probably not true for everyone of course but like okay something to think about I mean I felt like even with my first birth I was unmedicated um but I got a really fat bill and I think my insurance is okay but I was like this is crazy how they itemized every little thing and I didn't even have like a medicated birth <laughs> Do you, do you mind sharing? Do you remember what that total was versus like hospital versus what we can talk about what ends up happening with the second birth, but, or like what you paid for your midwife? So my midwife this time around was around like 5k. Okay. 5.5K. I'm sure the hospital was like three times that. Um, wow. And then I think insurance covered it a little bit, but the itemizings were ridiculous, like cleaning, yeah. cleaning tools or something, you know, like no <laughs> yeah um that was really like disheartening to get like bills after bills after bills when you're like a first-time mom too and you're like chasing them telling them no I didn't even have this like xyz so this time around I also felt like I wanted to play a flat fee and not question anything and not have that have to worry about that um so yeah it's I think it's totally all about the money I've heard many stories like yeah. I think some people don't really realize too, like the hospital, like, and I don't want to demonize hospital settings because I know some people who actually do appreciate and love the hospital setting for birth, because that actually is where they're comfortable. And I just, you know, I feel like the more I learn and the more I talk about it, it's like, okay, yeah, I just, I really just want people to feel safe wherever they are and know what they're signing up for. Right. But yeah. hospitals are businesses. Yeah they're for profit. Yeah. So like, it makes sense that they would bill like what they could, you know? Yeah. And um, speaking of hospitals too, I always felt like when people tell you like birth where you're comfortable. And I was like, well, I worked in hospitals. Like, it's not like I'm uncomfortable with hospitals, but mm. I'm actually like processing my birth. I'm like, it was totally a business. Like I've, yeah, I've never been comfortable in the hospital. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, I know my way around. I can, I can do that, but at least from a nervous system standpoint, like my, I go into sympathetic and I'm just going to treat the people. Like I did a, a seven week round in a Brooklyn County hospital. And I feel like even having that experience and then having had, uh, 
what's it called? Just like volunteer internships or something like that at hospitals while I was in college. Like those environments just never felt like what, like what I would want for yeah, like birth. But yeah. That's but then cool. like in our minds or like what we're conditioned as women is like, no birth happens in hospital. Right. To me, like, that's what, oh, yeah. like, it's what you, you see know, everywhere in hospital. So I just feel like now that I'm on the other side of it, I just wish women knew their options, you know, like there's so much more options, not just right. Hospital. Cause now when I talk to women, they're like, why you didn't get birth in the hospital? And I'm like, that's yeah. I mean, you have options yeah. and options. <laughs> so, okay. Take us, take us back to this second birth so you you guys got your scan then and then um you found out the gender and then where were you at um and then let's see so we had a couple of midwives visits um and then I what felt I just like I would hike every day and I would listen to like a free birth society podcast so I didn't really read any this time around I'm like I don't need to read any more birth books I don't need to watch anything I got off social media totally I just like really went in there because I didn't want to hear any other voices I didn't tell anybody about our plans for home birth if no one questioned me I didn't tell them um I think I only told like one really good friend about the whole rebirth too um Mm. Cause even like my mom, my mom's OT and she comes from like a medical background. So when I kind of mentioned it to her, um, that was hard to kind of take in because she wasn't that positive about it. And that's like a whole nother thing, but, um, mm. because how did she give birth? She had four of us, but she gave birth unmedicated all in the hospital. Okay. But I was like, mom, hmm. like you've done this before. You should know that it could be as natural, you know? <laughs> Um, and I always thought like, if I had a daughter, which I have two boys, I'm like, if I had a daughter and she decided to do this, I'll be like, yeah, I'll support you all the way, you know, <laughs> like, hell <Totally>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I'll talk about that too, because at the end she was at my birth and it was really beautiful and yeah, it was really cool. And oh my she God, I can't talks, wait to hear this. Like, and now she just talks highly of it. <laughs> Oh my god! And it like healed us. You know, it's like a healing. Yeah, it's a whole continuum of healing. Isn't isn't wild how birth can be so redemptive? Like, I love that word so much. Like, it was mentioned in another episode, um, another birth story. But uh, yeah, it's so healing. It can be so healing for the lineage. Oh so, oh my god! Even like with my first birth, so me and my mom have a good relationship, but it's. Um, like I come from a Chinese background and I don't know if you know, like in Asian culture, the moms are very like tiger mom and they're very, you know, like you're never I enough. one of those two. <laughs> I never, I felt like never enough for my mom or never good enough, but um, she showed up with my postpartum and just like loved the baby, loved me, took care of me. And that was her way of um, showing her love, you know, and that really healed our relationship. And I just, yeah, I just, I love her. <laughs> for that that's amazing um oh and it's just cool because yeah I don't know I don't know how to put it in words other than um yeah I don't know uh like my cousins have like like a similar situation and I'm like have a baby your mom made me. <laughs> <laughs> like this is where the child will actually heal the relationship <laughs> It's not maybe between the partners, but definitely maybe between yeah. your mom and yourself. <laughs> oh, how special. But, yeah. Um, so I really like keep diverging. So my second. No, it's okay. Birth, um, the midwife. Yeah. So it was a pretty straightforward pregnancy. Well, so both my pregnancies, I get really, really sick, like from the beginning all the way to like 20 weeks. So I'm like miserable the whole time. But it, after that, it's like smooth sailing and I'm myself and it's good. Um, the second birth was just total, n- not birth, pregnancy was so different than the first one in the sense of like, I didn't worry about anything. There was no anxiety. I just did whatever I want. My first birth was kind of 2021 pregnancy, 2021. So like during COVID. So there was a lot of like, don't go out, don't fly. So I didn't see my whole family for a whole year because I was living in the East Coast at that time. That was hard to kind of like, it was very like isolating to be pregnant by myself and not be able to see my family. The second pregnancy, I'm like, I'm doing like 
I'm not sick. I'm just pregnant and I'm going to do whatever I want. So I, I did, instead of like a baby moon, we did, I had me and my girlfriends, two of my best friends, we hiked Zion when I was seven months pregnant. And I just like, can't recommend that anymore. Like people should not have baby showers. They should go out with their girlfriends, your closest girlfriends, build you up, like, just like love you and nourish you. Mm. It's so good for my soul. It's so good for my baby. Everyone was looking at me like you're crazy. <laughs> and I was like, well, I hope I just give everyone like encouragement that they can do this hike if they saw me doing this hike. A hundred percent. But it was just, it was like a fun pregnancy because I almost didn't feel pregnant, but I just did whatever I want. As in like, I'm not just helpless person who's pregnant. I'm still really strong. I'm taking care of my toddler. I'm walking, I'm doing everything. Um, so I really just mentally prepared myself to, as in, like I told you, I cut off like all social media. I didn't want to like have any exercise in me. I didn't have any family just really kind of focused on like working on my own self and the fears that would come up with this birth. Um, and like how to juggle motherhood with all this too, at the same time. Um, so yeah, it was a really awesome pregnancy. Um, when it came down to my birth, he was due on Christmas, oh. um, which is really cool. And also don't tell anybody when you're due, cause I'll ask you a million questions. So I just say you have, a, I'm having a winter baby. Um, but he, you don't know, like the due date is not even like a, it's not a for sure thing ever. And it gives you this sense of the baby is late. If you go beyond that due date and that's going into potential, I don't know if you're doing something like a systemized birth and inductions start to happen and blah, blah, blah. Right. I love the idea of doing like, just saying a seasonal time frame. Yeah. Like, like a month, a month time frame, whatever. Yeah. And the cool thing about the second pregnancy too, is you're so, I was so busy with the first toddler that like, I even forgot what week I was anyway. So in somewhere in my mind, I was like, I don't know what week I am. He's going to come when he's going to come, you know, <laughs> which is really cool um, to think of it that way. And a lot of questions were like, oh, well, if I told, like I told my immediate family, I plan to have like a home birth. A lot of questions yeah. were like, where are you going to birth? I'm like in the pool, in the bed. I'm like, I don't, that's like a silly question. Too. Like, he's going to come when he comes, like where he comes, you know, like I can't plan. Like I need to have a water birth. I need to have him on land. I need to have him on bed. He's going to come wherever like, he comes. I literally imagine stations. Like you want to have like a little water station you want to have a little dry station. You want to have a combo station. And I don't know. <laughs> like it it amazes so me when people like actually get to do that or when they say that too, because I'm like, good luck. Because once you're in that birth, like labor zone, like who knows what you're going to have ready and what, you know, you can only mm -hmm. be as prepared as you can be, but I feel like you can't prepare at all. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, that is a mental, rational, like struggle that I'm personally going through right now. Like we can totally go down this rabbit hole later if we want, but yeah, just the, how much are you actually preparing? And then how much of it is actually just like a practice of surrender and like, what, where's that line? I think you should just totally practice surrender. <laughs> like don't practice anything <laughs> else other than learning how to surrender because you never know what's going to happen. And that's really what it comes down to. I feel like with birth, like it's really just surrendering and letting your body do what it needs to do and trusting in your body and my baby. And yeah, so I would just go on. So my second one, um, end up going all the way up to like three days before 40 weeks, which was so different than the 37 weeks. Cause I was thinking, Oh, I'm 37 weeks the first birth maybe he'll come early too which was kind of like messing with my mind too at the end because I was thinking again that this one's going to be early um but he ended up going like three weeks past past not really past so I was kind of getting a little bit anxious too which was like all bad um but I don't know prior to that week before Christmas like no really feelings I think like one Saturday I went out with some friends and that night I had like five hours straight of like kind of contractions during the night, but then it went away. And then for that whole week during the weekday, like nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if like, it was just kind of like already priming my body and getting ready. Um, but everyone was texting me like, how are you doing? And I'm like, he's fine. He's probably going to stay until like 42 weeks. Like he's just really comfortable in there. <laughs> I probably have like another three more weeks. Um, but that night 
um, we like had a fire in the backyard, roasted some chestnuts with my son and my mom. And I think I kind of always envisioned that too, that like I would have a fire that would be like a last ceremonial thing before the baby's born. Um, my mom arrived from California like the week before. So like everything was just kind of like getting in place for my body to kind of feel like relaxed, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then that night, I think around like 10 p.m., I kind of woke up with a strong like contraction and I was, I go sleep with my son. So I was kind of snuggling him. I'm like, okay, maybe something's happening, but I have all night. Let me just like sleep it off and have this like cuddle with my son and maybe something's happening in the next week because there was still no like water breaking, no like bloody show or anything. Um, so I went to use the bathroom and of course my toddler wants to follow me to the bathroom. So he mm -hmm. follows me and then I see like one little speck, like a little speck of blood, like so little, like barely anything. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like something's happening. Something's happening in the next week. I thought I had time. Um, went back to bed, cuddled my son. And then it got like really intense and my son was starting to wake up. And then I called my husband in and I'm like, I don't know, something is like just really strong. Can you take Elias? That's my first son. And he was like, yeah. And then he was like, what else do you want me to do? And I'm like, I don't know, just like do anything, like get something ready. So he started like getting the tub, getting, filling in the, the, um, what do you call it? The birth tub? The birth tub. Yeah. Um, started filling in the birth tub. Um, then we got like, I think he texted the midwife, like, oh, something has happened. He was like, do you want me to call the midwife? I'm like, I don't know, like do whatever. But in my mind, I think, I, I think prior to a week before I was even trying to tell him like, do we need to like go over things? So you know what to do. And he's so chill. He's like, no, it's okay. If he comes like, I don't know what to do, but he's like in tech and he doesn't really know anything medical at all, but he's so <laughs> relaxed in that way, which is really good. Um, and I, sorry, I want to mention too, like during this pregnancy, um, even if I had no exams or anything, I also wanted to surround myself with women. So I joined like a woman's circle, which mm. was so beautiful because I just wanted that feminine energy. And they did all these like blessings for the baby. And it was like with women that I never even met with before, but it was just, I think it was a pivotal thing in my pregnancy just to be like surrounded by feminine energy too and kind of like make me feel confident in what I was doing and um that was just a really cool thing that I did I love that um, so I think and no one's like my husband doesn't really ask about birth and what I want to do he just trusts me so in that birth woman's circle they a lot of women which is straight up ask like oh what's your ideal birth and then like you're not really like faced with these questions only like inner I am but no one like out really really asks me that um because everyone just kind of assumes I'm doing it in the hospital the first time you know <laughs> so it's really cool to be around these women who are like hell yeah free birth you can totally do it and it was the first time like I was 30 like 35 weeks and that was my first time meeting someone who actually free birth like two women in that woman's circle and that oh. was like just signed to me because I'm like tell me all about it like I need to hear your stories like I need to and I feel like it's probably like how I am telling Tita, like, it's kind of boring, simple, like no thing. But then to us, we're like, tell me, like, I want to hear about it because this is what I want to do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And like, I'm telling you, like, I feel like I'm not anyone like special. I'm not like super, like, I'm like, I did not, like, I'm just like you. I'm just like any other woman. And I feel like if I can do it, then anyone can do it. They just need to know their choices and kind of, um, learn about it a little bit more, you know, like research it if it's right for you. Um, I never want to push free birth on anyone, like, but I want them to know that it's a normal thing that women did like years ago. Yeah. It's like, you don't know what you don't know. And yeah. if all you know, and all you've seen is hospital birth, which again, like doesn't have to be like birth doesn't have to be traumatic and home birth, free birth does not preclude tra trauma. Essentially, if you're trying to avoid something, right? Like, I don't know. It's such an interesting mind boggling thing, right? If you're, you don't have the exposure to something that can be as simple as free birth, just because it's been conditioned in us to outsource our power, outsource our inner knowledge, our body's wisdom to doctors, nurses who have all been there before, done it before. And there's like, for sure, something valid in that, right? 
but I think the process of surrender, like that is trusting in yourself. And I feel like what, what an empowering remembrance to take away all the interventions, the sabotage, or even like the, because they've all been through it before, not all doctors, not all nurses have experienced or witnessed pure physiological birth without keeping their hands off and hands out of a woman's body. Yeah. I'm, I agree with that. I feel like, no, I don't feel like no one has really seen like physiological birth and it's definitely not taught in schools and yeah. I no. agree with that. Yeah. I mean, they're amazing for what they're taught and they're taught to care for emergencies and they're taught their interventions for emergent situations and birth is not always an emergency <laughs> like birth is natural it's not like you said like you're not sick you're not ill you're not disabled even though it's like kind of a blessing that you do get a little card if you want it you know <laughs> yeah because yeah your body's going through a lot of change but it's not like it's not a medical condition yeah and that was a huge difference between my two births because I think my first birth I'm like yeah you know like everyone should kind of cater to me <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. but then the yeah. second one I felt so much more like empowered like no I'm not sick I can like I can hike this I can do this like no I can like I'm still a strong like I'm strong <laughs> um yeah and that was such a cool thing like that mindset to have that with the second birth it felt so much more like just embodied and like really like I'm not sick you know I don't know how to put it yeah. but um yeah. What do we, what do we leave off at? So, okay. So you had, you're mentioning the woman that had shared the birth stories for them with you and just how empowering that was. And it, it just like offered, I think a reminder for you, like your choice was going to work out. Yeah. Yeah. So hearing the two women who free birth and I was just like, really? Like, do you think I can do this? That's like my plan. Like, I really want to do that. Like my plan is maybe not my plan, my ideal in the ideal birth world. I hope that I can just give birth and then call the midwife later to like do all the cleanup and the paperwork. And they're like, yeah, that's a good plan. You should do that. <laughs> but again, like I, what, like, I feel like, yeah, I mean, obviously there's so many variations in what free birth or home birth can look like. So I think part of um, the benefit, I think of hearing stories like yours is that this is the way you did it. And that's what worked for you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like to not keep her, keep her handy, right. For what it is that you actually wanted her for. Yeah. So, okay. Go on, go on. How did it actually unfold? Because obviously like I paid a fat chunk for her. So I needed to like use her in some way. Although she was such, she was, I think she would have been, she was a great midwife, very like respectful of my decisions and everything else. And never really like questioned me at all. Was like, okay, yeah, you got it. This is you. Um, so yeah, that was really cool to just meet those two women and hear their free birth stories like when I was around 35 weeks. Um, and then, yeah, fast forward back to my birth. Sorry, we're like hearing it in bits and pieces. It's okay. So my husband texts my midwife like um, something's happening. Um, and of course the midwife kind of goes, okay, well, can we update it? Like you never know, you know, like I think in their minds they're thinking like a labor is like still long. You have at least a couple hours. Um, but I kid you not from the, it's so cool that you kind of text her because you see like a timestamp from 1030 to like, it was literally half an hour and I had a baby in my arms. So like, I don't know how I got so lucky that I skipped active labor, but I didn't like have active labor. I just like went to the room. I told my mom to grab my son she went downstairs and that was a funny thing too. Cause my mom's kind of came in and I kind of had that one conversation with her. Like, mom, I don't know how you feel about this home birth, but I told you like months ago, but if you want to be there, I would love for you to be there. But if not, if you have like any fears or anything, just like either leave the house or I don't, I didn't want to be like surrounded by that energy, you know? Yeah. And she was kind of just like, you know, I'm going to, I support you in whatever way you need. Like, do you want me to watch your son? And I'm like, no, he's going to be there. <laughs> and he was, she was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I like rehearsed with him. So I told him he's only like one, two and a half at this 
like less than two and a half, two and three months. So I'm like, okay, um, he calls me Mimi. When Mimi's gonna um give birth to baby, like she might like scream and yell, but you just say, It's okay, Mimi, you look beautiful, you got it. And he like really rehearsed it and it was so cute. Like he was like, You got it, Mimi, you look beautiful, you're so strong. <laughs> oh, just like your affirmation giver the entire yeah. time. But when the time came when I actually was contracting and like doing my noises, he was like really scared. <laughs> Oh, that my is. mom ended up taking him down which I'm so glad like my mom was there because in like my ideal birth I wanted him to be there but it was like too much for him um so she took him down which was good because otherwise he was like really he he was like scared for me and thought something was hurting me so he was like attached to me but I can't like labor with attached baby on me <laughs> yeah. and it was so fast so like literally in that half an hour I told my husband like you need to grab Chuck's. And of course I told you how he didn't want to rehearse anything, like go through the supply list of what I had. And he brought over like a baby blanket. I'm like, this is not a Chuck. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> he kneel on it. I'm like, no, I'm about to give birth. Like he's coming out. <laughs> so he grabbed, like, oh the Chuck, and I was like on all fours. So the, the whole birth pool was like out the window, like no time for that. Um, And I just, felt like one contraction his head came out his head was there the whole ring of fire it was I don't and people think I'm crazy for this but I think because I did so much research on like the physiological birth and like how how the baby needs to come out and do its turns it was like not and I told him my first birth I felt like I was dying like literally dying but this one it was like the head came out the ring of fire and it was not painful at all it was just like Mm -hmm bliss and like I knew exactly what was happening his head stayed there for a while my husband's like do I pull him out and I'm like no don't touch him I'm like don't touch him wait for my next contraction and then he just came out and slipped out and so my husband caught him oh, and I know and I was like give me my baby <laughs> and then he gave him to me and then I think the first thing I said was like his lips are so beautiful <laughs> And, um, I said, call my mom, get Elias up. And then they all came up and then, yeah, it was, it was so fast. It was intense and it was simple. And they got me up and we just laid in bed and it was like, I was like, that was so epic. Like, how did I just do that? (laughs) Like epic. And then as I like process it later on, like when I get to tell it with you, it's just like so amazing. I just keep thinking like, this is how birth should be. And it's like a true example of how undisturbed birth can really unfold itself beautifully and like simple and it's like no drama at all. And he came into the world so calm and my first birth my firstborn is also really calm so everyone was saying oh your second one's going to be like so wild and crazy but no this one's like even calmer than the first one wow (laughs) and I so believe that it has to do with like the way they come into the world like no gloves no beeping sounds no washing off like I just like held him and smelled him and like it was just so beautiful like and we just went into bed and stumbled and it was like any other day which is crazy because you're like, no, you just gave birth. <laughs> yeah. But it was uh, amazing and epic. And like, I if I can do it, anyone can do it. Like you can so do it. And it was really just like, I try to like question myself all the time. Like, how come I skip like active labor? Like what, how did I, how did I do that? And I think, I think it was really just like really surrendering and like letting your body do it when, what it needs to do. I didn't even push like I, with this baby, it was just like breathing him out. Like I breathed him out and I didn't believe that can happen because my first hospital birth was so coached, like push now, push now. And although he came in like six minutes, it was still like a forceful push, but this one was like, I need to, I want to, I really like listened to my body and just felt what it needed to do. And it's going to do what it's going to do. If you just let it, let it do what it's going to do, what it has to do. A hundred percent. I think that's actually something again, if we were going to talk about it from like, we're both like therapists, OT, PT, and I know you're getting into, you're doing pelvic work now. Right. Um, 
And I feel like the message, even just the word like push or like birth, uh, prep or, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, birth prep obviously can include a lot of things, but even just like talking about pushing, I'm like, your body doesn't, your pelvic floor is not pushing. Your abs aren't pushing necessarily. It's your uterus contracting. And if you have the ability to connect to your breath in this, like, I don't know, just this heightened state or this like otherworldly state that you potentially end up going to when you're in the labor process it's like that's all it is is like you're getting out of the way mentally yeah you know and when you're being coached either by a midwife or whoever you know doctor ob it's it's overriding whatever message your body is trying to bring to you and you're you're not hearing yourself, you know? Yeah. And they're, they're definitely trying to look out for you, right? Like they're looking, hopefully they're looking out for you in a way that, and for the baby, maybe, I maybe. <laughs> I think there are very few OBs that do that well. But it's like, how, like, that's crazy to me to, when you're saying that, because like, how can how do they, know? they coach us? And how do they know? Like, it's not your body. It's not them like feeling it, right? So now that I, had those two different births and being coached to push and then like actually doing this birth where like I really surrendered and listened to my body and let it do what it's gonna do it's like um like it's crazy that we would do the other way around let someone tell you when to push even though it's your own body you know like yeah. and what you're feeling but like you said like now they're like talking to you and then you're not hearing your own body or feeling in your body so yeah that was like and then when you say that, I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like, it's so cool with the second birth and how really it was just me and my baby and my own body. And yeah, my husband was there to catch it, but like, he didn't do anything. Like it was really intuitive of, you know, it was a total embodied feeling for me. It's yeah. so rad. Can you share about the third phase basically of like birthing your placenta and maybe the differences in those two births with that and like how you cared for that and for yourself afterwards. Yeah. So the placenta just came out. I, I totally forgot my placenta. I went to the bed. Um, and then the placenta just kind of, I went up to use, I went to like get up cause I felt like a kind of an urge feeling and I just got up and it just kind of like came out on its own. And that was, I didn't, in the hospital, I didn't get to see my placenta, but this time around, I got to look at it, the tree of life. I kept it. I just, before we moved, we did a little ceremony and like dug it in the tree of my house that we birthed the baby um, mm. on the hundred day of my second son. So like on his hundred day birthday, we did a whole thing with it. Oh. Um, and the placenta to me is like such a, it's, it's twin. You know, I learned so much about that during this pregnancy too. And people are like asking me about cutting the cord and all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, the placenta will come out when it feels like the baby is safe. It'll start to detach itself. And once all the baby gets its oxygen and blood and feels safe, it's going to like naturally come out. You don't need to tug. You don't need to do a fun, like you don't need to do all that stuff that the hospital does. Yeah. The and aggressive fundal massage. Yeah. It's your baby's twin. Like it nourished your baby for like those whole 10 months and I just think it's like crazy that they just toss it in the hospital <laughs> I know like even if you're not going to use it for encapsulation or something it's like it's still a really magical organ that you grew for your yeah. baby and I yeah I feel like having ceremony around it like you know burying it where it feels honored and yeah taken care of I guess I mean, it's amazing. Like it's a whole new organ that our bodies grow just for the baby and nourishes it. Like it's crazy. So it's cool. so crazy. Oh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. So how did, how did your second postpartum go? Cause you said with your first one, right? Your mom came out and she took care of you and helped you out with the baby. And did she kind of, so, so wait, wait, hang on. You moved just recently. So how long ago was this, was your second birth again? Um, he was born in December. So we moved like when he was oh four gosh. months. 
yeah so like still in the middle of like kind of postpartum but my postpartum this time around my first one was beautiful too because my mom came but this one felt even like my healing was so much quicker I think so I did so the midwife ended up coming like half an hour later did all the mm -hmm. paperwork did all the cleanup packed up her pool <laughs> um thank you midwife I, yeah that was like the easiest check you have <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, she was like, that was insane. Like you texted me half an hour ago, <laughs> like that something was happening. How did you just birth a baby on your own? <laughs> um, so she had never like been very hands off before in any of her other past births. Or well, like... I think she prepped us in the sense saying that second births could be really fast. So it's could be common that the birth can be really fast, but she's like, don't worry, I'll always be there because she thinks she has time from the time that you let her know that something's happening, that she'll be able to come and catch the baby, which I was like not having it. I'm like, you're not going to catch me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, um, but I think, yeah, it sounds like she's always there to catch the baby with all of her births. Um, wow. Well, yeah. That's crazy, right? I think Lucky like, her. <laughs> so although I like really loved her, there was like one question that threw me off during one of our last things. She was, she didn't even ask me. She just turned to my husband and was like, do you want to catch the baby? And I was like, why did you ask me? Like, I want to catch my own baby, but I don't think it's yeah. like hard to like, depending on what position you are birthing. I was just going to ask you that. Cause you said you were on all fours, right. And your husband did catch your baby, yeah. but did you ever feel at any point? Like you could, like, you knew his head was there when it was just his head. And you were feeling, I'm assuming, or like, did you feel like you might have been okay? You I just weren't touching like, with your hands. No, yeah. I kind of just felt I was most comfortable in that way. But I feel like what I've heard with people who catch their own babies, they end up getting on that like one knee and they can like catch like that. But I was no way in that feeling that way. <laughs> that's yeah. so that's so wild. Yeah. I always imagine, um, I know it's a gnarly show, but Handmaid's Tale, like, I think that might've been one of the first free births I actually ever witnessed, not knowing that that was free birth. And obviously that was probably really hard for her, <laughs> for that character, but she's like in front of the fire, she's roaring and, you know, on all fours and she doesn't catch the baby. I don't think I can't remember, but yeah, the, the almost like just kneeling half kneel <laughs> yeah I mean either way the baby can will come out and like you think it's gonna drop but it's not gonna like hurt itself it can just slip out and drop and it's fine and you just slip it over I, yeah. I'm like literally imagining like babies babies will slip out and then like bounce for a second and then like almost land <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, uh, but speaking of the handmaid's tale so I think that's such a cool um, the night before I gave birth to, I end up watched, it's so silly. Um, we watched the mother with Jennifer Lopez. I don't know. It's on Netflix and she, it's like a new movie that she has, <laughs> but she's Was like, she, oh. isn't she like an assassin or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's kind of like, <laughs> the theme of like she'll do anything for her daughter. Cause she's like this strong mother. Right. But in that, did you end up watching it? I didn't. Okay. But you can tell me at the end part, she's kind of like hurt but then she sees like a wolf walk by and she gets like really like empowered by that wolf because if she doesn't get up then that wolf is gonna like eat her you know or something like that mm -hmm. but then also in handmaid's tale before she goes in and gives birth she sees also that wolf too and it was like a really weird thing because I'm like what is this like wolf symbolism that I'm like popping up all of a sudden like the night before I give birth and I think in my head too I'm like okay this is cool like I think when I'm like kind of in the when I'm like really laboring and I'm feeling like a little bit, I'm just going to like think like wolf, you know, but I never got that opportunity to think like that because it's such a fast birth. <laughs> um, but, but no, yeah. that's incredible. It's, I mean, the wolf and the wolf mama, like, I feel like that's also, that's so prevalent for me right now. That's so funny that you bring it up because I'm reading a uh, woman who run with the wolves and it's all about the wild woman archetype. Um, but yeah, it's, my first time reading it and uh Crazy. I've never read it but I've heard so many things about it I need to read it it's very interesting it's very interesting and she puts it into she puts into words I think so beautifully how how I feel like how I want to feel too um like going into something like 
just natural birth and motherhood. And it's obviously, I like roll my eyes at myself because it's always easier said than done. And I think my, my imposter syndrome creeps in a little bit um, because I obviously haven't had that experience yet. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's just I like coming back to the surrender piece, like it, that message is just always kind of been there ever since the true desire for motherhood has come through. Like, you know, I I was a teenager babysitting and loved kids always. And like, I was, I think sharing with you before recording, like I was considering going into pediatric physical therapy and that's how much I loved kids. But it wasn't until probably a year and a half ago that I actually was getting this like real biological drive and desire to become pregnant, you know? And since, since then it's like the message has always just been surrender and trust, surrender and trust, surrender and trust. And there have been a lot of different ways that that's come through for me, but I mean, I feel like just, this is the ultimate, you know, experience of that. Yeah, definitely. And I just, I don't know even how to tell you, but I just know, I, I feel like if you, if you can totally do it, like I, every woman who is even interested, I'm like, yes, you just need to like trust your body and surrender. And like, I really didn't do anything special other than, I guess, I mean, I think I'm doing what you were doing. Like you're just kind of envisioning and prepping yourself for it. And like even having that mindset of it and like surrounding yourself with other women and hearing their stories and counseling out the noise and really just listen to yourself and like be confident in yourself in it. Like, yeah, you can do it. And if your partner's yeah. on, it doesn't even matter where your partner's like, I wish I didn't listen to my husband the first time. I'm like, I could have done this birth. I wish I did this for the first birth too. Cause now I would never do a birth any other way, mm. you know, like. And I feel like I can say that because I had the hospital birth and I can compare it, you know, like, yeah, this was epic and like, not, it was bliss and beautiful and I would not do it any other. So my postpartum was just, I felt, so I did tear, but I told the midwife, I'm like, if I can go without stitches, I would love to do that because I did tear the first time and I got stitches and I ended up getting like weird pelvic stuff like nine months later. And it felt like just Mm. funky, you know, um, or there was like scar tissue or whatnot but this time I'm like just let I didn't even know that you can let scar tissue heal on, like let tears heal on its own too see that was like not an option my first birth so this time I was like I don't want any stitches and she was like yeah that's fine and I did like herbal baths and it was yeah I felt like my healing was so much better my I didn't like experience any postpartum depression my first one but like you know less anxiety with this after this one too um yeah. And like, think, I think the best part is just sharing it with people who want to hear, because I'm like, it's just a really natural, beautiful thing. Like we're portals of life, you know, like our body is like, let it do what it's made to do. And like, it was a pure example of how birth can be like, if it's just left alone. Yeah leaving it alone I think that's like the a big message that I keep getting and kind of similar to you um just trying to cancel out as much as I can uh and I feel like like listening to the free birth society podcast like that's helped me mentally a lot I think and just the more I hear the stories too, of even like the births that or just from the same woman who has a hospital birth and then a home birth or a free birth. Um, it, it is just like incredible that you don't have to do anything like externally it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be interfaced with I don't know, other entities and other interventions. And like you said, you know, you just let it, let us do what we're made to do. Like yeah. leave us alone. It's funny. I heard on an episode, um, I think pretty recently 
and, or maybe it was a, maybe it was a masterclass, but anyways, they were like, when you Google or when you ask a vet, like what to do when your house cat is pregnant and then laboring, you leave her alone. I thought that was so funny. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, why? Yeah. Why are we always we, disturbed? Like we're not totally. like any other animals too, right? Like if I think someone also told me like to prep, you should watch like animal births because they birth like in the wild and they're like left alone and it's normal. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think it's um, like kind of coming back to the wild woman archetype. And I feel like this again has been just so prevalent for me and these like conversations that I've been having for this season of the podcast. Um, but it is, I feel like an act of embodying your wild self, having a, having a free birth. Yeah. Oh, you can so do it. I'm like, so pumped I'm just gonna have you record some affirmations for me and I'm gonna like plug that into a, a song. so let's talk about really quick about how like we are on the medical side so my question now is to now because I just had like mentorship with like another um OT and when I told her about my birth she's like that's like amazing like you're gonna help so much women but then I get like you probably get this question a lot too when women are like what can I do to like prep for my labor and xyz whatever and to me like my really heartfelt answer is like you don't have to do anything like your body is gonna do what it needs to do but here's some exercises you can do like I don't know like totally. what, draw the line with that <laughs> yeah I mean that's that's really funny because like we were talking about right it's there's whatever, so much preparation that you can do, whether that's mental or physical, emotional, like whatever preparation. Um, And then there's the surrender part, right? And maybe, you know, I could probably argue, I could argue just how, like, if you were say gonna have surgery, like for your shoulder, how strengthening up your shoulder, getting as much range of motion as you possibly can could help you start at a different baseline for your healing after the fact, after having surgery. So like prehab before actually doing your rehab in post-op. But I feel like, yes, like for the actual labor and birth process, like there's nothing you can really do to prepare. But like I was saying before, like practicing surrender how do you practice surrender in your everyday, I guess, you know, just being aware of things that might like light you up or maybe is like hard and then letting yourself breathe through the process or breathe through the emotion. I don't know. There's like all of that for sure. Sometimes, I mean, like this is, I guess also I can process out loud here. Um, like, I don't know, I don't necessarily always want to be on the backside of, of pregnancy and birth. Like, I would love to be able to see more people in pregnancy and more so because like you were mentioning, at least in the first trimester, obviously, like you can feel ill, you can feel like the nausea that you're experiencing is, you know, debilitating and really hard mentally, I think, to get through. But I mean, your body is growing a human and there are going to be aches and pains. So maybe in the pregnancy, it's like, okay, we can, we can manage that. We can make that feel potentially a little more comfortable for people, but that's not necessarily a preparation. Right. And yet if I'm able to get someone feeling good enough to keep exercising and staying strong, what I would probably have them do in pregnancy is I call them like mama moves or motherhood moves, new parent moves. And essentially I'll just share, like make sure you can get into a squat multiple mm-hmm. times, make sure you can deadlift and row either with double leg or like staggered stances. Probably you probably wouldn't do it single leg in new parenthood, but I digress. Some people do. Um, and just knowing the motions that you're going to be doing and how to counteract that. So just anything that's really heart opening, essentially. Yeah. Cause you're like breastfeeding all the time. Yeah. Yep. All the cradling, all the nursing, all the just cuddling and, you know, loving on your baby. There's a lot of closing in. And also it's like, if we're thinking about the way our posture 
is a reflection of our inner world. Like I feel like postpartum, at least from what I can, what I've read, what I've taken in, who I've spoken to and seen, it's like, it is a very still like inward Mm -hmm. place to be, right? Like you just had a freaking baby. (laughs) Yeah. And no, you're not going to be maybe wanting to be all out there and exposed and everything. It's like, it, it was a big cracking open wide in some ways. Right. And then of course, like your body is going to like, kind of stay, want to stay protected in a way. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's how I feel. It's always like a bubble and um, like COVID to me was like a silver lining in the sense that like, we didn't get visitors in that first, you know, first year of his life. And that was amazing because it was really just like our time in our little bubble. Um, but yeah, I just, I still feel like that until I like stop breastfeeding. I feel like then I'm more like, okay, yeah, I'm a little bit more free, but like, as long as I have a baby attached to me and I'm nursing, I just want to be with my boys. And, um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, yeah, everything that you said, I, I would wonder, I wonder how you would um, interpret this too, because yeah, again, like we're both in the healthcare system or like, at least we, we practice with a license, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Like I, I don't practice in a hospital or clinic setting. I practice out of my house and whatnot, but um, I was thinking kind of about that, I guess, yeah, socially speaking, um, like kind of the the mind boggling thing that I'm going through, I guess, uh, with again, where I want to be and how I would want to have a birth, but also just from the sense of, um, like knowing the body so well. And I feel like maybe that's another piece of preparation that I'm, I'm curious if people see it this way or can see it this way, like knowing your body well and I really mean intimately well um pelvic floor knowing your anatomy internally where your urethra is where your um just generally obviously hopefully you know where your vagina is and feeling your cervix being aware of these internal sensations like knowing even where your womb is and like say you have certain sensations in pregnancy or during birth like labor like I mean, kind of like how you were saying that you couldn't really get into that mindset of being like in that wolf energy, like honing that in. I don't know if someone who had that, that integrated knowing if they'd be able to like access that and feel that and be able to name that in the moment. But I, I'm curious, like I have no answer for that, but I am curious if you had spent that time. I don't know. I feel like what is so sad is like majority of women probably don't know our own anatomy right like I feel like we're not taught that in school or sex ed like it wasn't until I got into pelvic health and when I talked to my friends like you know do you know where this this and that and they're like no like they had no idea like the anatomy of their own like vulva you know Mm -hmm. it's all like really taboo topics and I think yeah, maybe I got lucky in the sense that I am like an OT. And ever since I had my first birth, I got interested in this. And I wanted to like learn more about this and figure out how I can like have a good birth and prep myself and learn about this stuff. So yeah, maybe not a lot of other women have the language or the resources. I mean, I guess they can have us if they work with us. But I think a lot of people like I was never referred to pelvic therapy after my birth either. It was never an option. Really? Mm -hmm. which is why I feel like I wanted to get into this because it's such a big need and gap and like women should know all this stuff you know yeah Um, that's like I know I think following you you're doing um like a cycle cycle syncing which I am like all about too and I'm like this makes so much sense like how come like women don't know this stuff at all it wasn't until I went to that first woman's circle and like she had us going around saying like you know, who you are and what day you are in your cycle. And I was like, I'm like in my thirties. I don't know that. How come I don't know that? Like, 
And it's crazy because then I started to learn that. And I'm like, yeah, we should know this about our bodies. Like to like, why don't women know that? <laughs> why don't we know that? Because, because it's dangerous. We're dangerous. And when we know too much about our bodies, we take back certain levels of power and that can leave other people feeling uh, like they have no upper hand, you know? Yeah. Isn't that it's, so messed up? I'm like, I, I can like go on about this because I'm just like, I can't believe yeah. it. Like, <laughs> I know. It's really, it's fascinating because there's almost like, almost uh, the stages of grief, but more so just the certain stages that you go through as a woman where either if it's about like your period and your cycle and embodying that and all that information, maybe even about your fertility and then later about pregnancy and birth and postpartum motherhood, like you go through stages of, or at least I've felt this for myself. I've felt stages of complete anger and frustration first like why wasn't I given this information and then you go into like okay integrate 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 and then embody 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 and then what do you do with that information right like sometimes you can all you need to do is just be with it and utilize it for yourself but then there are people like you and I who are just like no we are now advocates and we're gonna share (laughs) yeah oh my gosh 100% that's exactly how I feel I get like mad that we're not taught this and then I'm like okay well then let me be responsible and teach myself this because hello like I'm capable of doing that and then but wait like I want to share this to the world because how is no one knowing this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And especially, yeah, I've, <laughs> it is funny because I feel like for a long time, like the answer when people would ask in PT school, like, why are you in PT school? It was very common for people to say, well, I had an injury in high school and my physical therapist changed my life. So now I want to do that for people. And that story never resonated with me because I, never really got injured. Like I had calf cramps and shin splints in high school, but like not a really giant injury or anything like that. I just loved the human body. I loved the way it worked and everything. Um, But I totally resonate with just that kind of experience now because yeah, I wasn't taught any of this stuff and a lot of what I experienced. And then what I learned was out of me search. Like, yeah, it was for myself very selfishly for myself. Yeah. And then I was like, wait a second. I can help. I can help other people now. <laughs> like you did degrees <laughs> for something, right? You went through schooling. But that's how I feel too. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, OTs, like, I mean, I'm sure you know pelvic health is like a PT world mostly. And so like OTs breaking into for OTs, it's like a whole nother. Like a lot of people are like, I didn't know OTs can do it. And um Yeah. Like OTs, chiropractors, like there are a lot of people that are getting into pelvic health now, which is cool. Great. And I feel like I'm, I'm at the stage, right? Like I was saying where I think I want to be more on the education side. Like I want to be more on the exposure side and sharing what I know, sharing who I know, like my, my, I have gifts of being able to feel and touch and like that is very practiced and exercised and great. And I do think there's a little witch in me that like loves that ability to feel that with people and witness them and hold them and help move things for them and with them. But um, yeah, like I, I want, I want some more flexibility and I want to be able to I guess, get to the root still like doing the hands-on sometimes still doesn't always feel like the root. Mm -hmm. Um, It's very important work and I love it when I get to do it. And yeah, I think there's the education piece, but I don't want to be a childbirth educator necessarily. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So it's still, I don't know. It's very interesting. Like you find your place eventually, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, hopefully, I mean, I feel like we're like at different stages too, you know, like you had your career, you're in pelvic health. I'm like, want to start that. You want to have 
babies and give birth and I did that now <laughs> we're like kind of yeah, but exactly it's all like a really cool journey and um they say like when you become a mother and just even pregnancy like so much creativity hits and I feel like you're already getting really creative and you're like wanting to birth something too and like just gonna it's just gonna keep filling up more so just embrace it <laughs> thank you thank you for that reminder Samantha uh -huh. I appreciate you so much for sharing your perspective and sharing your story and is there anything else you'd like to let our audience know maybe if you tell us where you are um because I know we talked about it off record but tell us where you are and if you're offering your services how can people get in touch with you yeah um I'm in San Francisco California and I am just about to start my business so I'll shoot Yay. you on my website um maybe you can give me some words of wisdom because I obviously have lots of uh imposter syndrome with that <laughs> Oh my goodness. You've got this. Oh my gosh. If you... we will do this off record. Yeah. Um, but I totally believe in you hands down. But I mean, my goal is really just to like help other women and make them feel like they can do birth any way they want to birth, but know that there's options and I'm here rooting for you and cheering you on if you want to do free birth. <laughs> Cause I just, you can hundred percent do it. Anyone can do it. And it's more important for me. Like, I just wish women can feel like what it feels like to feel truly like embodied and really trusting your own body and your own baby, because like no one else can give you that feeling other than yourself. So just really like we've been saying, like surrendering and trusting your own body and trusting your own voice and counseling everyone else, like just do you and do what you want to do mic drop that's good <laughs> that's a perfect thank you I thank you for having me it's right there of course so fun chatting with you I feel like I can totally chat with you off record like non-stop I would like love to meet you <laughs> yeah <laughs> anytime you come down to San Diego I'm here for you and we can totally do that and if I travel to San Francisco I will let you know 100 uh, percent yeah I, I would love to do a San Diego. my best friend's out there actually she's a nurse in Pete's so yeah we got to do a trip I want to do a trip to visit her with the kids that would be so cool uh well thank you everyone for listening and yeah if you do want to reach Samantha I'll put her new business information in the show notes and we'll see you guys next time thank you